Uh, just some housekeeping. This is a hybrid event. So if you have any questions or comments or have any technical issues, please put these in the chat. Um, we'll also be recording the event. Please keep your camera off if you do not wish to um, consent to being filmed. The Auslan interpreters today in this meeting are Melissa Smith and Therese Lewis. Please pin these participants if you need an Auslan interpreter for this event, and they will be swapping interpreting every 15 minutes. I would like to um, make special welcome to some very special guests joining us today. Paul McKnight, Deputy Secretary of Law Reform and Legal Services Division at DCJ, Department of Communities and Justice. Catherine Tolner, the Acting Deputy Secretary of Corporate Services Division and our Executive Disability Champion at the New South Wales Department of Communities and Justice. And Rosalind Croucher, the President of the Australian Human Rights Commission who joins us online today. I would like to begin by acknowledging that I'm meeting you all from the lands of the Wandandian people of the UN Nation. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you are all meeting from today across New South Wales and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining the launch today. Um, I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing connections to culture um, and to the lands and waters of New South Wales. I also want to welcome people of all abilities and I would like to acknowledge participants living with a disability and the systemic barriers and challenges that people with disability often face. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker, the President of the Anti-Discrimination Board, Helen McKenzie. Helen is a respected employment lawyer and business leader and was appointed to the role of President of the Board in February 2022. Welcome, Helen. I will hand it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Jacqueline. And can I first of all start by also acknowledging uh, that we're meeting here in Parramatta today on the traditional lands of the Darug. Uh, people and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. It's an absolute, uh, both a pleasure and an honour uh, to be here participating in what I guess is the culmination of a very significant project that we at AD New South Wales have been working on in, in partnership with the Employee Dis Disability Employee Network. Um, so it is an absolute pleasure to be in at the launch uh, of the Workplace Adjustments uh, Project. Disability uh, is uh, one of the most common uh, grounds of complaint uh, that we receive at AD New South Wales. Uh, in addition to the, the important functions that we have uh, in dealing with complaints and uh, inquiries, we also though have uh, a statutory uh, function to, to try and eliminate discrimination through education, through the development of uh, resources through research, through consultation and, and community engagement. Uh, and uh, whilst uh, disability is a very common form of complaint, and we see that from our inquiries as well as our uh, complaints, uh, it identified itself as one of the, the areas that we really needed to, uh, to focus on by way of raising awareness of the adverse impacts that it can have uh, in the workforce in particular, uh, and also to try and uh, identify and, and develop some resources and tools to uh, help both employees uh, and employers uh, manage. Uh, it's important, I think, when one looks at workplace adjustment to, to understand it's not just about um, eliminating uh, unlawful discrimination, it, it's also about um, being open to the uh, opportunities that uh, just by making some minor adjustments in the workplace, people with disability uh, can um, benefit from and not just um, work in a, a discrimination free environment, but but realise their potential and actually thrive and develop and 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 be productive. Uh, so it's it's a fantastic uh, resource that we have developed uh, and I'm really proud of the work that's been done uh, by the team at AD New South Wales, in particular, uh, led by Debbie Newen, our Manager of Communications and Engagement, uh, and other members of the team, one of whom you'll hear from uh, very shortly. Um, I'm sure you will find, uh, as I have done, that the resources are fantastic and you'll get some great um, benefit from them. Jacqueline, I'll hand back 
to you. Um, enjoy the enjoy the rest of the launch. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. I'd la now like to introduce you to Molai Kamara, the Community Engagement Officer at Anti-Discrimination New South Wales that led the Workplace Adjustments Project. And he's going to talk to us about the project and introduce the videos. I'll hand it over to you, Molay. Thank you very much, Jackie. Thank you, Helen, as well. Um, I'm, I'm quite delighted to be here today and to, to see so many people who actually made today possible. Uh, so this this project of uh, that anti-discrimination New South Wales is about to launch today, started about 12 months ago, 12 uh, July of last year. And um, it started as a result of a consultation, community consultation that, that we conducted prior to the project. And that consultation focused on the challenges that people with disability face in uh, finding work, but also within the workplace. And one of the, the major themes that, that came from that community consultation was that many people with disability experience uh, challenges in accessing uh, workplace adjustments uh, at every stage of the employment pro process. So from the stage of applying for positions to the to the point of career progression, uh, they, they, they identified workplace adjustment as one of the, the key uh, challenges uh, that, that that they face. Um, you know, in, in, in not only the new South Wales public sector, but also across uh, even with the, the private sector as well. So uh, for this project, we 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 worked with um, disability employee network leaders and diversity and inclusion teams as um, the the key players that 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 you know that have a lot of work to do around the uh, area of making workplace adjustment uh, available to their teams. So. Um, and that involved uh, disability employee networks from about six um, New South Wales government uh, departments and agencies. So including uh, Department of Customer Service, Department of Communities and Justice, uh, Transport for New South Wales, Department of Education, Health Share New South Wales, and uh, Department of Planning and Environment. Uh, it was a great uh, collaboration that has now resulted to the uh, videos and podcasts that we are about to um, launch today. Uh, the videos and podcasts essentially aim to increase awareness of the importance of workplace adjustments, uh, but they also aim to contribute to the conversation around inclusive workplaces, um, not only for New South Wales public sector, but also for uh, the private sector as well. And our primary audience for this project actually are hiring managers. So um, anyone who supervises or manages staff, um, HR and diverse, diversity and inclusion teams, uh, including uh, talent acquisition and learning and development teams, uh, because they play significant roles in ensuring that uh, their teams have access to workplace um, adjustments. So we, we are grateful that um, a lot uh, of you from those teams, HR, uh, diversity and inclusion teams have, uh, are here today. And some of you have been involved at different stages of the of this project. And, and we hope that you'll be able to use these assets, the videos and podcasts that we have developed uh, you know, to assist in the work that you do in the provision of workplace adjustment. But also we hope you'll be able to share it far and wide um, so that the, the word goes out. And we've also had the privilege of working with um, managers and um, people with disability in uh, the New South Wales public sector for this project. And, and they have been kind enough to share their stories. Um, so one of them actually told me that I asked them, why, why, why are you interested in doing this? And they said to me that um, they want to share their story. Uh, they believe that sharing the story will um, Add to that conversation and and perhaps contribute to to change. So so our hope is that the message uh, in the video and in the videos and podcasts that we are about to launch today will you know will will go to to leaders but also HR uh, people uh, hiring managers so they can use it to make that happen for their teams. And. Um, yeah, we, we are also grateful that this project was guided by a, a project steering committee group. Um, a lot of you are online today and some of you are here in person. 
uh, we are grateful for your for expertise and experience and for guiding the process uh, from the outset. So it's been a collaborative engagement uh, that has resulted in what we are about to see today. Uh, we won't be able to share with you the podcasts at this launch, but you'll be able to access it on our website and on the QR codes that have been provided. Uh, uh, but we will now at this stage um, play the videos for you to have a look. Thank you once again very much for, for your contribution and your support. And I don't want to name names, but you know uh, who you are in terms of what you've done for this project. Thank you. Thanks, Molai. I think we're going to go straight into the first video. Hoping someone's going to play that. Won't be too much longer. Okay. I think I do you want me to play it? Will I? Okay, I think I might yes. try and share. Yes, yeah, Jackie, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Always technical issues. Um nothing ever goes smoothly, unfortunately, with technology. So I'm going to play for you video number one, and I hope Pin everyone can see that. Can everyone see that? One in five people have a disability. So look, it's important to ask those questions, but I think it's also important to be aware of it in the first place. I have nyst nystagmus, which means my eyes will move rapidly without my control. I have a spinal cord injury, which was acquired uh, in 2015. I have an acquired brain injury and spinal injury um, that resulted from hemorrhagic dengue fever. And then um, 11 years after 12 lots of brain surgery, I um, developed multiple sclerosis. I didn't really know what adjustments I could get but then I got a push for it so we had a like I could get like screen like two new screens with screen arms to help bring screens close to my face to see. By giving me time off in a sense to go to physiotherapy which I continue to do uh, I make up the hours I work on weekends I work late. A sit to stand desk was purchased for me and um, I was allowed to work from home you know before people really did. Encouraging people to come forward and feeling comfortable to be able to tell us um, what their what their issues are and, and what we can actually do as an organisation to make the workplace even better for them. It doesn't matter if somebody has a disability, we're, we're really employing them for their, um, their experience um, uh, in, a, in a particular role. Always, always ask your employees questions about them don't don't be afraid to ask anything being excluded isn't a nice feeling um, so by making adjustments um, we're actually including you know people within our organization along the whole you know along the whole way so we have a dedicated inquiry officers who can answer their questions. They can't offer them legal advice, but they can offer them information about the sorts of things that the legislation covers and, and can refer them for legal advice as well. Fantastic. And that was the first video that um, was put together. I just love how they talk about, um, you know, how providing workplace adjustments gives people equal opportunity within the workforce. I'm going to play for you the second video. Apologies. Here we go. 
It's important to realise that one in five people have a disability or might acquire a disability at some point in their life. Um, so, you know, having that confidence and having that understanding that if you do acquire a disability, you're not going to suddenly find yourself out of a job. I'm autistic. Um, I am autistic and proudly so. I've got a learning disability. I've got also attention deficit disorder. I've got uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and I also live with severe depression. Reduced lighting, so um, at my desk, um, the light directly above is removed. Allowing flexibility, so if I was having a bad time, I could you know, work from home for a few hours or maybe you know, have a shortened day. I need extra time when I'm doing my job, so, and also I need consolidated learning. What that means is sometimes if the job's a little bit technical, I will need someone else to give me a hand in regards to explaining it. I haven't really need much in the way of adjustments. It's more just been about awareness for managers and colleagues in how I function, how I relate, how to communicate. I much prefer very direct communication, being quite literal at times and just being very specific and not leaving things quite open-ended. I have a caring attitude and to just sit down with them and ask them, like, how can we help? You, you know, achieve your goal. There is a balance between uh, doing your research and listening to the individual. So for example, if um, you know ahead of time that uh, you're going to have an autistic employee, do read up a little bit about autism. We're just people at the end of the day. We're not something scary. We're not foreign, we're just people. Transport for New South Wales has the Enabled Network and that's for people with disability as well as people with carer's responsibility. So we have a dedicated inquiry officers who can answer their questions. They can't offer them legal advice, but they can offer them information about the sorts of things that the legislation covers and, and can refer them for legal advice as well. Okay, Fan absolutely fantastic videos and thank you to all the stars of those videos. Um, it, it's really great to see people sharing their stories around disability and their workplace needs because there's a lot of people who actually would benefit from workplace adjustments and from hearing your stories and hearing what works for you. So we're going to move into our next session. Um, I'd like to introduce the stars of these videos and podcasts who will be taking part in a panel discussion. So we have Kerry Chin from Transport for New South Wales. We have Deborah Connors from HealthShare New South Wales. And we have Andrew Ratnidge, a manager at DCJ, and he's joining online today. So I just really wanted to start off by asking Kerry and Deborah. So I'll go to you first, Kerry. How have workplace adjustments made a difference to your life at work? Oh, I think you're on mute still. We can hear you now, Kerry. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, it's a bit echoey though. Is this better? Again? Yes, it is. Perfect. So I'll just ask that question again. How have workplace adjustments made a difference to your life at work? Uh, when I first received a workplace adjustment, it made a major difference to me. It was during my second year in the graduate program when I realized that I really needed an adjustment. At the time, I had been putting up with the exceptionally harsh lighting in that particular office for a few weeks, and I was slowly becoming more and more unwell from it to the point where it was affecting my life outside the workplace. I eventually had an opportunity to mention the issue 
in a meeting with my placement manager. And luckily for me, he was familiar with the concept of allowing reasonable adjustments. So I was allowed to move to a quieter location further away from the printer, but still next to my team and had the light above my desk removed. So while the office environment was immediately better with the reduced lighting, it eventually took me over a year to recover to my full health. And during that time, I still often needed to wear sunglasses inside the office, even with the reduced lighting. That was back in 2013. Since then, I've asked for the same adjustment at every subsequent office I've been based at, and I've never had a problem getting it, even at the locations where I got the impression that the placement manager didn't like me very much. Um, I eventually got a permanent role at Sydney Trains in 2015, and I've just reached my 10th anniversary at work earlier this year. I wouldn't have lasted this long without the adjustments. In recent years, newer offices tend to have LED lighting, which is better for me because um, LED lights don't flicker the way that fluorescents do, but they tend to be a bit too bright. So I still benefit from, uh, as I call it, my reverse spotlight. Um, as with many other office workers, I also had the opportunity to start working from home when that suddenly became mainstream due to the pandemic. And it is also a good option for me in terms of um, the adjustment that I need because um, obviously by being at home, then I get to avoid the um, issues with the office environment. I mean, that's my main adjustment, but um, of course, in addition to that, uh, had the general understanding from my manager and colleagues are uh, also a very important part of this whole thing where um, I've been in my team for quite some time now. So uh, my team has mostly adjusted to um, working with me and the way I communicate, um, they understand uh, what bothers me and what I'm alternatively also what I'm good at. So it works out quite well. Yeah, absolutely. And look, I really resonated with you, um, particularly around the lighting issue. That's uh, that's an issue that I have. And the difference one thing can make to someone, one little just changing the light to LED and the difference that's made for you. And I know the difference it's made for me. And, you know, a couple of things that you talked about there was the workplace adjustment you wouldn't be working without that workplace adjustment. So it has helped you have longevity in the workforce, which is absolutely fantastic. And that's something that I absolutely resonate with as well. And, um, you know, it's so imperative that you we have the support of our managers and colleagues around our needs, um, particularly around workplace adjustments and the different experiences that we have um, with as people with disability um, with different managers. Um, so understanding workplace adjustments, understanding the difference it can make to someone's whole life really um, and longevity in the workforce their day-to-day -day, um, you know working life and personal life is just really important that, and we'll talk with um, Andrew more about managers a little bit later thank you for sh sharing that Kerry I really appreciate that I'm just going to go over to Deborah now and and ask the same question um, how have workplace adjustments made a difference to your life at work Deborah? Oh, you're on mute still, Deborah. I love how this is still our um, our catchphrase <laughs> three years later. No, there's still no sound coming through. I think that might be a tech issue from our end um, because I see that she's got a a cross against her um, mute button. So it may be from our end, from the settings end. Whilst we wait for Deborah to resolve those technical issues, um, is Andrew ready to go? We might come back to Deborah once we resolve the, the mute issue. Andrew, are you there? I can't really see him. That's okay. <laughs> no, no, Debbie, uh, Jackie, oh. I'm here, and uh, but you can't see me. Oh, okay. No, we can't see you. Of course, my um, camera's my camera's on. So. 
Okay, we're having a few technical issues. Um, you know, this is all happens in an online event. Doesn't matter how prepared we are. So, um, I'm, I'm on now. Oh, Deborah's back. So, <laughs> if we could get someone to help Andrew with his camera by the time we get back to Andrew, that would be great. All right, Deborah, thank you so much. So, how has workplace adjustments helped you at work? Well, very much, I, Kerry, and 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 you said you said yourself. I wouldn't be working if I, they hadn't made the workplace adjustments, but it hasn't been that onerous. I had been a long-term employee of HealthShare when my spinal cord injury occurred, which was in 2015. So I'd been there eight years. So I was a known and trusted employee, um, I, I hope a valued employee. And pretty much from the beginning, uh, the staff, my manager, who's Carmen Reckbauer um, at the time, who you saw on the first visit video also, they were so supportive. And, you know, from the word go, and our new chief executive said, anything we need to do to get you back to work, we'll do. And so there were some physical readjustments. They put, you know, door openers to get into the kitchen, and they created a accessible bathroom there was one in the building that was on the ground floor old building you know so but I took someone's office I always felt bad about that but um and but the biggest adjustment it, it's not only just to my workplace but to my work is that I go to physio uh, twice a week it used to be three days a week it's three mornings a week I should say and uh, physio has meant that I can live independently. So that has had an impact on my life. But by allowing me, it also means I can continue to work. I'm healthy enough to work and work full time. And it has been a two way street. I They give me the time off. I used to sometimes go in the middle of the day, but now I do it first thing in the morning. Uh, I start at eight o'clock, I finish at 9.30. They ba barely know I'm not there, you know, and it, it it is good. And people, again, the support has just continued and continued. Um, you know, when we're arranging meetings for various projects and, you know, you say, what days are you available? I say, oh, well, I can't do, you know, Monday, Thursdays, I'm at Physio. They just, oh, yeah, of course. You know, it's just, it's normal. It's, it's BAU, you know, for all of us. And, but that has made such a difference and emotionally it has made such a difference because to work full time uh, and live with challenges, physical challenges, takes a lot of energy. But work is not one of the areas that I have to use all that emotional energy just to get by, get through the day. I can, um, because I have that support. And I'm sure my colleagues love hearing about my stories of how I'm achieving things in physio and seeing all my photos. And and they are interested and they congratulate me when I put things up on Facebook and and so forth. It, it's, yeah, it is, it is like um, it beyond my non health share friends, but health share is it being like a member of the family. And it really, they didn't have to give up a, a, a lot, and they can, and they've got a very loyal employee in me. You know, um, yeah, there's a lot of benefits, and hopefully, I contribute still. Yeah, you know, then we're not a charity, and but I was a valued enough employee that it was worth the effort. Why why lose a good employee, and then a very loyal employee? Absolutely, absolutely. And there's a few things that you talked about there. Um, you know, workplace adjustments are not just about physical, um, you know, equipment or changes to your environment. It's about providing some flexibility to attend doctor's appointments um, or flexibility in how you work, where you work and when you work. I think that's really important and understanding that is a part of workplace adjustments. And it's about the employee contributing um, that, you know, to their best potential. And without that workplace adjustment, they can't work to their full potential. Um, another thing that you talked about is normalising that, 
it's just normal. It's just, you know, it's BAU, um, you know, and I think that's really important and something we need to really take on board. The discussion around workplace adjustments, around people's needs, um, you know, whatever that is, it should be BAU. Um, it shouldn't be different for everyone. And, and I love how these videos talk about those stories and shares your experience and Kerry's experience and Mandy's and Andrew's um, and a range of other people in that featured in those videos. Um, and the other thing I think that really got me that you said was you were a valued employee. And I think a lot of us who I think everyone wants to be a valued employee, but particularly when you have some struggles, you know, um, sometimes it's the most vulnerable times in your life if you're unwell or you have an injury or an accident um, and, and you end up having a temporary or permanent disability, you know, your sense of worth is affected. So you really, if you're contributing your best putting your best foot forward to, you know, in your employment, you want to be valued, you know, as a loyal and, um, you know, a hardworking employee. So I absolutely resonated with that. Thank you for sharing. Really appreciate that. Um, so I'm just going to go over to Andrew now. Um, so, Andrew, what is your one piece of advice to managers who are thinking about workplace adjustments but are not sure where to start? Thanks, Jackie. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Cool. Um, look, um, tough question, but look, my one piece of advice is not to be daunted or apprehensive about the process or experience. Um, for me, overwhelmingly, it's been a positive you know, if not life-changing experience from a, from a workplace perspective and obviously from a, being a manager within DCJ. Um, so, look, I really encourage everybody across DCJ and New South Wales government to seek as much information and support about workplace adjustments. Um, recently on the DCJ intranet, uh, a new workplace adjustment section has been launched, which provides best practice information and in so and, and um support to employees and managers. Um, some of that information relates to how an employee can seek um, information on, on adjustments and how a manager can make those adjustments for an employee. Um, it provides lots of workplace adjustment examples, um, more commonplace workplace adjustments, which um, we've sort of talked about today, but um, in particular for a person with re restricted mobility or movement or for a person who is deaf or hard of hearing, um, for a person who is blind or low vision, um, for a person with mental health conditions and neurodiversity requirements, um, and then for a person with long-term or chronic health conditions. Um, and also it talks about the work place adjustment passport, which is the passport that people can take with them across the New South Wales government sector. So they don't necessarily have to go through this adjustment process everywhere they go. It's a, it's a passport that will support them um, through their work life. Uh, and, and then I guess just a general advice around workplace adjustments. Um, so if you're on the DCJ intranet, search workplace adjustments, and I guarantee you'll find it because um, the internet something that um, my team manages, so I made sure that it uh, it returns number one on the search results. Um, just moving on, look, as I mentioned before, the work workplace adjustment process has been an empowering journey for Josh, who you saw in the videos today, um, and for myself, supporting Josh through that process. And um, also, as you, as you saw through the videos, um, I thought it was a good opportunity to reflect on what that workplace adjustment process look like for Josh, particularly in the context of moving to six Parramatta Square. Um, at our um, at our of office in Asheville, jo Josh works from a fixed desk location, whereas workplace adjustments um, were obviously in one place. Um, they were largely desktop related with specialised monitors and adjustable arms and consideration to lighting in the environment, which um, Kerry has um, talked about today. Um, I think most DJ, DCJ employees had a lot of questions and trepidation about the move to 6PSQ, but just imagine what that might have felt like for employees who currently have, who have, ha, have workplace adjustments in place 
and what that might look like at 6 PSQ. Um, you know, there's safety in knowing what your day-to-day -day physical environment looks like, but having a fixed desk location can be an isolating experience for someone who has vision impairment, uh, who might not have the ability or confidence to circulate in a normal office environment. Um, so look, my role was largely to support Josh through that change in the physical environment and the technology that was needed to support him. Um, in the lead up to the move to 6PSQ, some of the workplace transformation videos, particularly focusing on technology and how the desks at 6PSQ would be set up were very, very helpful. Um, and through those videos and discussions with Josh, you know, we were able to see that most, if not all, of Josh's current workplace adjustments could be managed at 6PSQ through, through, the, through the setup. Um, so this was very encouraging and went a, lo a long way to removing some of that anxiety that Josh felt about that move to 6PSQ. Um, so the next step for us was to set up a 6PSQ orientation and to see if Josh's current workplace adjustments could be managed there. And you obviously saw Josh in the video who was working at those desktops. Um, so that was a similar process that we went to. So um, Josh and I and another member of my team, Nicole, we went out to 6PSQ. We set up Josh's laptop. We worked from there for the morning. Um, we made sure that the monitor arms and desks could swivel to a position that um, Josh could work in, um, adjusted his chair, worked from different locations with different light settings. Um, and basically came to the conclusion that morning that, you know, most of Josh's workplace assessments could be managed there. Um, so look, after completing the workplace adjustment process with Josh and the team, you know, Josh felt confident that he could work from 6PSQ um, flexibly, but most importantly, with the autonomy to work anywhere in that office um, that he wanted to. Because, you know, for Josh, the most important part of being a at work is, you know, that socialization um, that we all sort of crave. So um, it was a fantastic experience to to go through with Josh and, you know, I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Fantastic. Thanks, Andrew. And there was a few things, you know, as a manager myself, um, a few things that really resonated with me and that's having how to have those conversations with employees with disability is so important, how you frame it, how you have those conversations. And DCJ is um, with extensive uh, consultation with the Disability Employee Network that I chair in DCJ have released conversation guides for employees with disability and for managers about how to have those conversations. Um, you know, we, we can't always uh, assume that the person with disability knows what they need. So you need, you know, first point of call is you always ask that person with disability, you know, what need, what do you need? Do you know what you need? But a lot of people with acquired disability through injury, illness or age sometimes actually don't know what they, they need. And that, you know, I personally had an experience as a frontline manager um, coming back, uh, returning to work from an extended period of time off due to health conditions um, that I didn't know what was going to work for me because it was new. My condition had deteriorated and changed. And I think, you know, being able to be referred to job access and being linked with an expert who understood what my, um, what I could try basically, and it is trial and error. So what we might implement now, maybe not what I need in six months time, because, you know, there is a fluidity sometimes and a changing need to disability. The other thing is, you know, for managers, we need to understand what disability is, you know, front and centre. What is a disability? It's a chronic medical condition, a health condition, an injury or an impairment that um, is impacted by the environment. And it's not the environment that disables, it's not the condition, sorry, that disables us. It's the environment that actually puts those barriers in place that causes the disability. So with workplace adjustments, it is so important because that actually gives us um, equal access and, and equal ability um, to do our job 
you know, to do our job like everyone else. And I always say um, for myself that just because we can't do it the same way as everyone else or the same way I used to do it, doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means we need to do it differently. And I think that's really important to understand those different needs and the flexibility of that. Um, we know that, um, you know, those meaningful conversations are so essential um, and having a supportive manager is so essential in the process. Um, you know, I think all of you spoke of, you know, men Andrew being the manager as well, but I know Deborah and Kerry spoke too of how supportive they had, of, you know, the support they had of their manager and how, well, their, how positive their experience was as a result. Unfortunately, not everyone gets to have that positive experience, particularly around disability, disclosure of disability or identification of disability or requesting different needs around workplace adjustments. So I think it's um, really important that managers understand disability, understand fluidity of and changing needs of people's circumstances, understand why people don't identify as having a disability and um, you know, understanding that it can be life-changing experience for, um, you know, life-changing experience for people with disability because it actually, we have the ability to do our work effectively the way we need to do our work and still be a valuable contribution. And we know that there's a Premier's priority in New South Wales to increase employment of people with disability. I'm just going to do a little plug here. <laughs> um, and, you know, we need to make sure that we have the right workplace adjustment processes, um, cultures, um, business streams, uh, business processes and practices to ensure that we do increase, not only increase our employment of people with disability, but increase our retention rates and development as well of people with disability. And workplace adjustments is a major integral part in that. And if we can get that right as our own organisations, as um, the public service, we um, we know that that actually changes the experience of our employees with disability. Um, I also just wanted to quickly comment, I know we're running early, which is why I'm talking, <laughs> um, is that making sure that workplace adjustments are done timely. Um, you know, Kerry, Deborah, or even Andrew, do you want to have were your workplace adjustments done in a timely manner? And if they were, you know, that's great. If they weren't, what was the impact on you for, for it not to be done timely? Uh, from my perspective, of, sorry to jump in first. Um, and, and can I say, can I give a plug to Health Share? Uh, we, we exceed the Premier's um, Direct, uh, New South Wales Government Directive to employ people with disabilities. I was a trailblazer, but we have people across the organisation, including um, people with hidden disabilities um, and who get a, a, a lot of support. And so I'm not the only one they've supported and it's not because I am I was a long-term employee. I mean, I think initially, but there have been, uh, we've employed, it really started a program for health share, but as for timeliness, it was excellent. I mean, I came out of hospital, I mean, I was in hospital a long time, but, uh, and into um, a building that had been changed for me. Uh, yeah, or the office, you know, the, the bathroom had already been constructed. Uh, the kitchen door was automated. And so it was, um, it, it, and I already was starting physio. So everything was, was done. And, but it was so, easy, you know, it was so important for me because I wanted to get back to my normal life. You know, I had a, I had a lovely life and hospital was this terrible aberration. And then I just wanted to get back to normality as quick as I could. Um, so for my mental health. It was so important. 
Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, it just shows we we need to do that better, I think. Um, you know, not just, it sounds like health share were on top of that. It's fantastic you were able to come straight back, um, you know, into a, a modified um, accommodation through workplace adjustments. Um, unfortunately, I think a lot of managers and a lot of um, people don't understand or don't know where to go to when someone needs a workplace adjustment. And often those conversations don't start until that employee's back. So you've now got the employee back to work who can't participate in the workforce equally because they don't have appropriate workplace adjustments, but then has to work and wait for sometimes those workplace adjustments. And unfortunately, I've heard stories where that can take several months, you know, up to a year for that to, Im to uh, implement. So it's so important that managers understand the need that this is essential and try to get those workplace adjustments as soon as possible, even before the employee is back at work um, for whatever reason. Um, absolutely. And Kerry, you know, with um, your workplace adjustments, you talked about changing um, departments and that it was great that they were they were able to implement the changes, the lighting and, and um, taking the lights out. Was that done quickly for you? And if it was, how much of a difference did that make not having to wait for those adjustments? Uh, so over the years, uh, the uh, different departments have done it differently, where some places it might take a um, day or two after I get there, while at one location I think I've had to wait up to a week. Uh, actually, in my current workplace, I've moved to earlier this year, my team moved from one floor to another floor in the same building. And um, I was hoping that they would have the light ready for me, but they didn't. And I think it was only next week when I came back that um, I had to follow up with the building manager to get this adjusted. But to be fair, these days I only go to the office once a week anyway. Um, I just wanted to also point out that um, at the very first time when I asked for this adjustment, as at the time I had already been working for transport for over a year, my placement manager was actually surprised that I didn't already have uh, this information in my record with HR and he was kind of expecting HR to have told him ahead of time so that he could have set it up correctly to do the right thing more easily. But um, at that time, I just didn't realize um, this was an option. And at that time, early in my career, I was also kind of reluctant to disclose my disability. So um, one thing I've heard in more recent years is um, the trial of uh, having the workplace adjustments passport, which would be very useful for people who move between different departments. So yeah, that's the way to go where having it set up in your record is very important. Absolutely, absolutely. And, um, you know, DCJ has just implemented um, a workplace adjustment passport, which went live at the beginning of the week. Um, and with those conversation guides, because it's not just about, you know, um, storage of, you know, electronically storing a person's workplace adjustment agreement or, or needs. Um, it helps people not have to tell their story. It actually helps our ability to change managers, to change in different areas without having to renegotiate the workplace adjustments again um, or even go through everything again because we tend if we don't have something like that, we having to explain ourselves um, and our needs quite a lot, and it does get very tiring to do that. And I, I know I, you know, I can see nodding, so everyone, um, you know, agrees with me in relation to that. So it's so important um, for our managers to understand, um, but all employees to understand workplace adjustments um, and the need for why it is so important. Um, and, you know, for me, just summing up a little bit from our conversation today, you know, it's about not just the physical equipment, it's about the flexibility. 
It's about how we work, where we work, when we work, and what's best for us to reach our full potential um, in the workplace. And, you know, Kerry said working from home has been given him, you know, um, impacted his health condition positively rather than going into the office and it impacting it negatively. So understanding in a post-COVID world, not to assume everyone can or wants to go back to an office environment um, and to have those individual conversations about individual needs um, in a respectful way is just so important. You know, and I say as, you know, in DCJ all the time in, in my den that um, we, you know, managers have conversations in your supervision with every single staff member about any barriers or any challenges they have. Don't use the word disability, just have they got any barriers or challenges in how they do their work, how they get into work, you know, start unpacking that and then start talking about that workplace adjustment passport to, to and bringing that flexibility. It could be just one simple thing like larger text. You know, we know that there's a, a, an intersection between age and ability. So, you know, as we get, as we have an aging workforce, these conversations are going to be so important to support our workforce in going on, um, moving on to the future. So just as something as simple as showing someone or providing someone with larger text or an assistive technology, you know, speech um, technology or a screen reader, you know, makes a significant difference. And like Kerry said, it was just that one thing that really made that significant difference. But also I think what we also spoke about was understanding um, that people have a genuine fear of disclosure of disability. So if you do normalise those conversations, we know that people are more likely to speak up earlier rather than waiting um, you know, and I really resonated with Kerry's story, waiting until, you know, you're really bad that it does impact your outside life um, and then saying, I need help. You know, we really, we talk about early intervention, I know in DCJ, and our, you know, with our clients, with the communities that we serve, we need to look at early intervention for our employees with disability because if we can get them to speak up earlier about what they may need or at least get them assessed for some possible options, then we're more likely to be able to support them um, moving into the future workforce. Um, and yeah, look, I think um, it's it's really important. I think the message to to help managers, leaders, and colleagues to support workplace adjustments in the workplace has been really clear during this launch and. Anti Discrimination New South Wales has done a fantastic job on the videos and on the podcasts that, you know, this is to support the work that we're all doing in our organisations. Um, and I really commend Anti Discrimination New South Wales for all the hard work. It's been a, a long 12 months, in particular for Morley and Debbie Newen, um, who've really been the integral players, um, you know, throughout the the inception and um, the development and the um, of these videos and, and these podcasts. So they're going to be putting the links to the videos, which are live, um, and the links to the podcasts in the chat. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and will be shared um, amongst um you know, it, it, on their on their website and amongst the participants today. And so I know we're finishing a little bit early. I want to personally thank, um, you know, Deborah, Kerry and Andrew for coming along and just talking, you know, a, a little bit, having a discussion about workplace adjustments and what worked for you and, um, you know, what may have didn't work. And, you know, from Andrew's perspective, from a manager, what support do you provide an employee with disability um, when they they need workplace adjustments. And I think we need to keep this conversation ongoing um, because we know there are many people out there who have disability. There are many managers out there who um, don't know where to turn and we need to be able to share our stories, share our insights 
um, and share our knowledge so that we can make the workplace um, much more accessible for people with disability. So I will draw this um, launch to a close. That brings us to the end. Thank you everyone for attending the launch of the Anti-Discrimination New South Wales Workplace Adjustment Series. We'd also like to um, thank the Project Steering Committee and the film and podcast participants for their involvement and advice throughout the project. As I said earlier, please visit the AD New South Wales website at www.antidiscrimination.newsouthwales.gov.au uh, to view the films and the podcasts. And we also encourage you to download the media kit um, to promote the series to your net networks as well. So thank you all for joining us today and um, we hope you have a fantastic rest of the day. So thank you everyone.